So far, so good. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Open it up again. There we go. If you like me in your tree, your fingernails, this will be a hard thing to do. Keep the crease at the top. And we've got a piece of paper that looks a bit like that. There we go, so far. Is there only one more thing you have to do? Just write your name on the piece of paper. <laughs> Schools, other coaches, forums, conferences, and I guess the, if you have a real dream to be a super coach, like an international coach or a professional coach, you need a media exposure and things as well. So there's quite a lot of times when coaches have to talk to people. And what I've learned through the sports that I've been involved in over time is sometimes the best player isn't the best coach. Sometimes the best player isn't the best captain. A lot of the times, in my opinion, it's because they can quite figure out how to communicate to the people that they want to talk to. So my coaches as a young lad until I got good at stuff, there was mums and dads and they had their own way of doing things. They used to whistle at us and used to do lots of press ups and run up and down rules and things. I didn't learn a lot about sport but I had a great time. And we just had to say yes sir and no sir. And, you know, coaching's changed. So, does anyone here quite like standing up in front of people talking? Jason? You've done with all this sort of stuff before? English teacher. There you go. So what, what would be your number one tip? Eye contact and scanning the room. You need to be engaging pretty much everyone because I'm about to start teaching seminars when you're doing yeah. uh, You need to be engaging. The moment the audience switches off, yeah. you're basically, you could be saying the alphabet for the, the impact of making. And you're absolutely right. Why why does someone else besides Jason think that looking at people when you talk to them is a good idea? In 70% of the presentations Jason and I see in business, people set a PowerPoint slide up and they come and stand like that and they turn away from it and they look back occasionally and then they walk up here and they peek over their shoulders and they look at their laptop and it looks a bit like that. I find it um, in the past for many it helps because you can gauge what your audience is where they're at, because if you're talking about something you're engaged, but they're all wandering, there's no point. And good communicate. Now, are you a Rachel? Or Rachel? I, Rachel. I prefer Rachel. Rachel. I try hard, I don't really know you there, but it's like... Yeah, you Rachel. Rachel, Rachel. Rachel uh, you're absolutely right, because good communication is a two-way process. And 
sometimes people don't give you much feedback, but if you look at them and you talk to them, you might learn, are they asleep? Do they look bored? Are they interested? Uh, uh, why do those people kind of like and those people there? Do they understand what I'm saying? And as a higher performance person, or maybe the leader of the presentation, sometimes people, people don't like responding, they don't answer your questions. Are you all happy with that? Yeah. Mum said, yeah, everything's fine. Then they go back home and they have a mind with them. It's not fine at all. Because, no, because people don't like having those conversations. Sometimes we can say, looking at people when you talk to them is quite a good idea, in my opinion, and we will talk about that. Um, the more you can, the better. Now, the other thing I'd like you to think about is people actually forget most of what you say. Within an hour of you saying it, you do a big presentation at a conference, pretty much everyone's forgotten about 80% of it. It's interesting to do a 20 question test on what Graham said this morning and how much you have remembered. Now, I'm guessing that Graham's quite a good presenter. He probably knows this topic very, very well. So, people forget most of it. They're thinking about Sunday, I should be home with the family, I should be going for a run, doing some sports stuff. Shouldn't be here learning stuff because I've got a real English teacher job to learn, I've got to prepare for Monday. Sometimes I just I guess that's kind of how things go. So people don't come along to your communication or your meetings or presentations with a totally clear mind. They've got other stuff going. First question that people ask me when I run sessions is, what time do we finish today? <laughs> That's usually the first question I get asked. Like, I can't do that bad, I haven't even started yet. People want to know, oh, well, I've got to go and pick up my daughter from swimming. I've got another thing to do. It's been a long day and I've got to prepare for something else tomorrow. So, yeah, there's people that got other stuff going on in their brains as well. So, looking at people when you talk to them, I think is very, very important. I will tell you, but later on you can actually look at people too much sometimes because it's a bit weird and creepy. <laughs> uh, too much, but he's absolutely right. Because a person lies as things and he's just quite right. People don't give you much feedback. It's a two way process. At least if you're looking at it, you can figure out how you're going. So, what else have you learned? What else is good communication about? If you haven't learned anything, maybe today's. Do you want to match how you voices and your gestures, trying to get all your messages, your body yeah. messages to end. I think so, Karen. One of the messages I'll give all of you today is the presence bit, where Mark gave the introduction before us. Whenever you sit or stand in front of people and talk to them, they form an impression of you. And those impressions come from things like how you stand, whether you move around, the eye contact you keep, what you do with your hands. It's quite amazing how some people that having lunch and chatting away to people when they go and do their presentation all of a sudden they become this person. And you think, well what happened to the person I was talking to over pizza? Mm -hmm. um, they put some presenter robot kind of thing on and something changes. So you're absolutely right. That if you're a hand user and a person that stands well, I advise you to do that when you talk to people this way. But there's nothing much I can teach about coaching, which is probably the few things I can teach you about coaching. There's nothing much I can teach you about your sport. You've got some football people here, I don't know about that. But what I can help you do is to get some of those messages across to those various audiences. So today, as Mark said, it's a very short session. It might seem long for you, because I'd probably like to think you're all leaving here by between four and four past four anyway, so you can help me manage the time. That's the plan. If you talk lots, keep talking like you're talking now, you might even get it done faster. <laughs> Because uh, the more talking you do and the less talking I do, I'm just going to go. Now you're going to forget most of what you learned today, which is rather sad. Which is why I provided you with the book. So you can write lots of things in it. I've got some things prepared. Take your own notes. And through Mark, if you find any value in this, and you have an important presentation that you have to give sometime in the near future, or the late future, you can give me a ring on help you, how's that? It's my gift, because I believe what you're doing. I, I think there's 10 sorts of people that New Zealand needs more of, coaches is in that top 10. So it's good on you, you buggers, that's what I say. <laughs> no, seriously, you're a, and most of you do, most of you work voluntarily too. So.
getting more things ready. So what I propose to talk about today is a few things. Firstly, how to put together a reasonable sort of presentation quite quickly. We need to write one on something. Mark, what can we write a presentation about? What's been, what was, what's the name talking about this morning? Performance right. planning. Hmm? Performance planning. Performance planning. Well, we'll do, we'll do, we'll write a presentation together called performance planning in my sport. Um, what Graham said, what I think he meant, and what I'm going to do differently tomorrow. That's what we're going to write about. Presentation there. Even better. Even better. <laughs> but it's a critique of it in some way. So yeah, it's a totally open book. There's no no tests on this thing today. And we actually don't have time for all of you to get up and talk for ten minutes. We'll write it together, and me or one of you can present it. Uh, so that's going to be really important. Organising your material. Just like you organise a coaching session when you talk to people, having it well organised helps it flow well and helps people remember it. Second thing, we'll, I think Jason and Cameron will talk about you and your ability to be yourself and put best practice, talk to groups of people. And then we'll talk a little bit about the sort of people you're talking to and how you, you might do things differently. And then we'll give you some tips on stuff. So does anyone here use PowerPoint in their presentations? Not at school? Jason, do you use it in sport? Uh, I'm usually out in the middle of the field. Good. So PowerPoint presentations kind of redundant. Yeah. So you're better off with a series of cones, yep. some sort of sporting equipment. You know, the, you know, the visuals you use are the tools of the sport. Is that fair? Sometimes. Sometimes you have a presentation in a different mm. setting. Other coaches, right? So you might. It's a white school. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. We should talk about those as well, perhaps. Anyway, more talking you do, the less talking I do. Ask lots of questions. And we'll get stuff done. So, in your book, I'm going to write a break the future to start around about page four. Four. I'll use the book chart. It's called Three Key Elements for a Presentation. So if anyone does ever ask you to help them write one, the first question I'm going to ask you is who are you talking to? So the first key element of the presentation is some audience. And Mark talked about it in his introduction and we met Countess Papakura or something, wasn't it, when we last got together? Yep. And the key, if I'm ever going to help you put a presentation together, is who am I talking to? Are they sports people? Are they more athletes? Are they other coaches? Are they parents? Are they sponsors? Are they people from Sport New Zealand or high performance something, whatever they call themselves? Are they international guests? No, everybody's different. So there's no magic template or no magic framework that works for everybody. Uh, anyone here ever done a personality test? You ever filled out one of those things like in a woman's day, am I a <laughs> rock star or a not Who's my celebrity date or whatever, you know? Or, or you've done those Myers and Briggs or those discs or those brain things, the ones with the colours or you know, and everyone's kind of everyone's different than what's it saying is people like to give and receive information in different ways. Um, some people like you to get straight to the point because they're busy dudes. They don't want the information. Some people like explanations. Some people like to participate. Some people just like to sit there and soak it all in and say nothing. Uh, some people speak a different language than you. I've got quite a lot of sporting presentations and half the stuff that people are presenting I don't understand because it's full of acronyms and buzzwords and jargons. And the people don't, it's like speaking French for me. But people don't understand what it is exactly you're talking about. So audiences are really, really important things and I would encourage you to think a little bit about who you're talking to before you start preparing. What do they know already? What language can I use? Do you away with? How do they like to receive information? Um, then you put your topic or your environment. And specifically what I mean by that is, is it a good news presentation or a bad news one? 
Uh, there's quite a big difference between giving people information where the outcome is they learn more about something versus persuading them. Maybe you have to talk to someone in your sport for more resources or get some parents to do something that you don't want to do. There's a difference between giving people information and giving people to change things. So Jason talked about a lot of his proceedings out in the middle of the field. So you don't always have a classroom where you can sit around with boards and chairs and those places too. Maybe there's traffic or in past or it's raining or something. But there's people in the other room watching the cricket. What was the score of the cricket at yeah. lunchtime? Who knows? That was one something for 200 or for two last time she. Yeah, there were 70 something for two when I was coming out. Pitch is drying up, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't play a spinner now. If you're a coach, would you put Mark Craig in the team? <laughs> yes, you would, wouldn't you? So. Mike, yes, I'm going New Year's honour for not playing a spin out of his team. <laughs> so you can't get it right all the time, can you? Uh, so is it good news, bad news? What's the topic and what tools have you got to get your presentation across? And then for me, yourselves, you, uh, just as important a tool as anything else. How's your government? What I don't want you to do today is to turn into some sort of very wrong news. The guy came down and talked to us for a few hours about presenting. Make you do all the stuff. So I think John, someone talked about low hanging fruit. Is that right? Is it Mr. Paul? Well, great sort of beats made it, yeah. So I would say that if I could give you some <coughs> low hanging fruit today, that you could grab three or four things and incorporate them into what you already do well, and we could grow your performance in the coaching area, that would be quite a cool thing. And John, your thing might be quite different from my last thing, and John, yours might be different too. So Perhaps if I can get through enough stuff, then we can learn a few things. It's got to be useful for you. Everyone, hopefully, as you feel a little more relaxed today, someone will start asking me questions. Someone will say, I usually get questions like, how many bullet points is a good number to put on a PowerPoint slide? So, or should I have my hands in my pockets when I talk to people? How much eye contact? There's a good amount of eye contact to have. Should you move around or not in presentation? What about jokes? What do you think about telling funny jokes? You get all these kind of questions and the answer to most of those things is it depends. And what it depends on everybody are uh, these very key elements here. You know? How would an audience feel about this joke? How do, how do people feel when you answer in your pockets? What sort of, you know, doing a very bad news or sad presentation, so where's the humour, where's the road for humour in that? And, uh, you've all been to at least one wedding, maybe you haven't been married yourself, but maybe you know people who have. You've all seen that best man speech, haven't you? <laughs> <coughs> so we have the grandma of the bride is sitting in the back going, my granddaughter's marrying that guy. And they didn't get the audience right, I guess is what I'm saying. We all would have thought about that. Because we shouldn't have wanted it. Should have had two wedding shorts, shouldn't you? You should have the family one and the, the rugby club one. Or whatever. So everybody, those are the three key things to think about with presentations. <coughs> Once you get that bit right, everything else flows from there. So turn the page and I'll put about an approach checklist. Everybody, the purpose of the approach checklist is twofold. If you follow, I've written it like a staircase climbing up from bottom to top. If you follow it from bottom to top, roughly in this order, two things will happen for you. Thing number one, you'll save some time preparing, which I think is very important, efficiency. Secondly, I guess one of the things today about high performance is going to be a positive result. So it's about effectiveness, better result, efficiency, saving some time. You put as much or as little time as the presentation is worth <coughs> to this stuff. First decision you have to make, and we'll start on the bottom of the page, is to decide if you will present or not. So decide if you will present or not. How many stairs are there? Oh, 10, I think. Yeah. If you do 11, you can just cross them out. So, if you're taking extra notes, there's a couple of things that you need to think about here. One is, are you the right person? Are you the person that should be doing the presentation? Do you know enough about the topic? Do you have the right relationship with the people? Or have you been given the hospital pass by somebody else to, to walk up and tell them? And the second thing is, you really need to do a presentation. Well, 
is cut, there are other forums and other ways of training the exercise you can do to get your message across. So, one, are you the right person? Two, is the presentation the right tool? If you answer yes to both of those, step number two is to, surprise, surprise, analyze your audience. Do an analysis of your audience. Who will be there? What do they know already? How can I best connect with these people? Once you've done that, you set yourself an objective. Now I'm guessing that that's probably the first thing that you learn on any coach program. Before you write a coach course, do some training, you sit down and think, what is it I want these young athletes or old athletes to do differently after the session? Do that, of course, think that's the <coughs> first thing, is that market people? Putting a session together, what's the purpose of this? What's my objective? What, are the, what should they be doing differently after this? And of course, everything you do in that session is geared towards helping them do that differently. So, it's the same with presentations. I've got to do a monthly report. I've got to talk to some people at a conference. I've got to meet the parents and introduce them to my high performance program this year. Even when I did some coaching, I was in football. You know, even the guys you get together and say, right well, guys, this, here's what we're going to do today. It's training, get sales warmed up, you know, we'll do this, we'll talk about the game, we'll work on our know, set pieces. And after that, we're going to have a little 15 minutes of three sides. Because you were terrible on the weekend in your close quarters position. So the whole session tonight is about improving that. And that's how we're going to do it. So we allow people to have questions. <laughs> but you have to have an objective. Now, this is going to be quite important a bit later on when we talk about structure and presentations because your conclusion or your recommendation usually relates to one of those objectives. So what is it? If you're thinking about objectives, what is it I want this audience to do <coughs> or do differently afterwards? And then you collect <coughs> data or information. In my experience, everybody, is that most people start there. When they're asked to put together a presentation or run a program, the first thing they do is they collect information. <coughs> Presentations are already done, they download stuff from the internet, they get Graham's printouts and handouts that you've already got all these morning. They look at stuff they've done before, talk to other people, and they get this big pile of data, and they say, you know what, all we've got to do is blame all that on a PowerPoint slide somehow. Strong piece of advice today is that it's probably not the right way to go. You only need to collect the right amount of the right type of data to help you achieve your objective with that audience. Far too many meetings and presentations are, have too much data in them, which is one of the reasons people forget most of the stuff. Because they like that toothbrush here they used to have in the old days where they get the flip top head and you're trying to push too much stuff in there and you're leaving it for people to think for themselves. And what is it? I'm actually supposed to do all this stuff. So the right amount for everybody on the right type of information. Once you have collected it, you then need to put it into some sort of an order. So choose a structure, everybody or a sequence. What are you going to say first? What are you going to say second? What are you going to say last? Uh, there are hundreds of structures. I'll give you a couple today that will help you with most sort of presentations that uh, we've already mentioned it briefly this morning, this afternoon, earlier on. Something visual, you know, whether it's sporting equipment, whether it's something you've done on a whiteboard or a flip chart. Maybe if you're lucky enough to do a PowerPoint thing with some handouts, visuals are very, very helpful things. Just remember they're there to assist your presentation, not to be the presentation. If you've written some notes down, I suggest you read it through. I guess that's the difference between a professional and an amateur, is that professionals practice amateurs at this point. If it's important to you, I would suggest you reverse it. Now, I will tell you before you go home today that you can over reverse things. It loses its spontaneity sometimes. <coughs> But 
simple things. If you're presenting with some, another coach, for God's sake, bring them up and ask them what they're going to be talking about. The worst presentations are those team presentations where people are talking about cross purposes and nobody understands them. If you've been given a 20 minute slot to talk to the parents or sponsors and you haven't practiced it, how do you know it's 20 minutes long? Believe me, I talk at sporting conferences all the time and I normally get the afternoon shift mark and normally the persons before me have gone on too late and I'm getting the organiser saying, oh, sorry, Kevin, we've got to be finished by four, it's three o'clock now, I know you were here for a few hours, can you just make it shorter, please? I say, I can do, still get the same bill, but it's not the point. <laughs> you know, get, a, get a bit of control with the other people, and I've got to have my feet down too, so timing. And if you're using any gear or equipment that you haven't used before, practicing using it's also quite a good thing. And then, as they say in the arts, force where you're natural, you do it. And some nerves aside, you should get a better result because you've got a more tailored presentation and should be a little bit better because of doing these things. It's probably a good idea as a presenter or a coach to have some sort of follow up at the end. And yeah, that could be your peers. Or someone in the audience giving you some feedback. You could also be sending out a questionnaire form or speak to the person who organised it. But if you don't do a lot of this stuff every day, it's actually quite a good idea to get feedback from people. So if your feedback is a gift sometimes if it's constructive, then my advice is just change one thing. The low hanging fruit you can pick a couple of things that you could do better as a result of the day. With nine, slightly more. Deliveries, and that's a really good thing for your organisation and a really good thing for yourselves in the sport. So, everyone, very quickly getting all the theory out of the way from there to there, roughly in that order. Just collect, but don't try and cram too much stuff. Practice a little bit, just get time to pull for you. Think about who you're talking to, I promise you will get a much better result. If you follow them roughly in that order, and you'll save yourself time preparing too. Way to try and hink your way through that data. So, does that make sense? Well, let's see about structure. Next page talks about from beginning to end. Some ancient philosopher whose name I cannot remember said all the things have a beginning and a middle and an end. And if you're presenting or your presentation is to be a good thing, it probably should have a beginning, middle, and end. What I've done in green while you're having lunch is just to write down what is the objective for you of the beginning, the middle, and the end of a presentation. And I'm going to ask you to tell me from your experience, presentations you've done and presentations that you've been to, what sort of things you might do here or say here to achieve best practice. So, if you're taking notes, the purpose of the beginning of the presentation, everyone, is to prepare your audience to receive the presentation. Actually get them prepared when they're in the room, get them ready to receive your presentation. And then somewhere in the middle of the page, we will spend our time this afternoon. The purpose of the end is actually to, a little bit sorry, to present or deliver it. And then towards the bottom of the page at the end, the purpose of the end of your presentation is to check that the key messages Check that your key messages have been received and understood. Now, key messages, everyone, because people are going to forget most of it. You'd be surprised what people do remember about presentations. Stupid stuff. Lunches. Air temperature. What the presenter wore. <coughs> people that talk too long, too fast. Actually, very few people remember lots of content. So if they're going to forget most of it, it would be a really good idea for them to remember something that you wanted them to remember. Which is why spending some time thinking about your objectives is a good idea. Jason, I'm sure that's the same with English teaching as well. I have some very good English teachers, so I enjoyed it. So stay on that page, everyone. And under the heading beginning, we have just written down preparing the audience to receive the presentation. Think about presentations that you've done yourself or you've been to, if you don't do many of them. The 
you've got the audience in the room, they're having a coffee, some people are over there on the mobile phone, there's people looking out the door, reaching around, some people are sitting at the chairs or reading, reading through the box to see what's there. And you're ready to go, basically. That's the kind of the situation that we're in. Could you equally be your athletes reaching around, just behaving themselves? No, you know what I'm saying? And you're ready to start the session. So, what's the first thing that you do? Give your attention. Well done. How do you do that? Did you actually write Singing that? or, you know. Singing? You can sing, yeah. Did you have a song? I, I don't myself personally, but I go to meetings with Play Centre and one of the girls, one of our co-presidents, will start singing. And everyone's like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> and I look at her and that's how she gets someone's attention. But, oh, yeah. So yeah, really silly that. songs as well. <laughs> I, I've done, I've done the with kids who are last one and sing the song, but I actually make the last one and sing the song, but it's always a... So Buzz, it's all about good laugh. putting people under a bit of pressure. Yeah, they're like, they run fast because they don't want to sing songs. Mm -hmm. So what about it's older people who aren't kids? You're probably going to say, I'm going to make you sing a song, they'll just walk away and maybe they'll come in. I think it's the, the sound and the tone and the voice and how loud you project. And um, you can see a, present, uh, a presenter who owns the space and walks in with that charisma and um, confidence and as soon as they speak you're attentive to what they're about to say so I think the first words that come out of your mouth um, needs to grab and demand attention because it sets the tone for your whole presentation. You're right, well you can go too far can't you? Finding the balance. Tension, we'll talk about tension. Good presenters need to generate some tension. Now you could do that by threatening them, you have to sing a song or do some press ups if you're late. Uh, what do people do in weddings to get people their attention? That's right, they, they bang on the wine glass, don't they? Everyone looks up. Raising your voice is a good one. Excuse me, everyone. Yep. Wolf whistle. A whistle like or a wolf whistle yeah. or a ringing a bell. Something that you might do. So, what you're actually doing is you're, you're spiking the energy in the room somehow to shake people up a bit, and then all of a sudden they look at you, hopefully. So you have to do it two or three times because it might be a bit noisy. I sometimes give the countdown two minutes to go or... It'd be better, so let them so know. So they know that it's coming. Good. So then you get their attention and then what do you do? Introduction. Well done. Some sort of a welcome. So thank you everyone and good morning. Well good afternoon in our case and a very warm welcome to our presentation presence. We session today for Sport Bike I Coach Advanced Program. Introduction, John. If it hasn't been done for you, my name is Kevin and I will be running your session today and with me is Invisible Paul and he'll be helping me a bit later on during the day. I like to sometimes just go catch bait right from the start before the intro and welcome. Like just start with a have you ever and go straight to like depending on the audience, go straight to um, the reason I know they're sitting in the room and give them a kind of indication that we're going to touch on it so that gives them their attention to it. As though as a creative opening. And then go into the welcome and the intro. That's what I think. And different presentations require different ways of doing it. So do some welcome, do some introduction. This is really important. What else might you do? You're running the session. Some sort of uh, overview, maybe a topic or a subject, maybe a, a what, what do you call it, an agenda or an outline. Here's what we're going to be talking about today. Absolutely. Um, you might need to have some administration in there too. If they're new to your club or building, you might need to tell them where the bathrooms are. Uh, three things that I normally do in presentations that I give, if it's any up to you, is I normally, first thing I normally do is I tell people how long I'm going to be there for. So everyone, I've got a, 20 minutes I need to talk to you today. Yeah, so let people know how long it's going to be. It stops them asking usually when they finish this. But if you don't tell them and you carry on, if I was still here at 6 30 tonight and you were polite enough to be sitting here, but I was still going on, 
join that and disappear down the door. People will be looking at their watches thinking, well, I'm not really thinking about what I'm saying. I'm actually thinking about getting out of here. So how long will it be? The second thing that I would strongly advise you to do in meetings or presentations is suggest to the audience when you'd like them to ask questions. Now in your case, the rule is you can yell out stuff at any time because it's more talking you do and the rest of the like the better it is. But it could be that you want them to hold the questions to the end. It could be that you've broken up your presentation or your seminar into chunks and you're going to talk a little bit about something and then you're going to take questions on the chunk and you're going to move on to something else. Take questions on that and you're going to move on to something else and take questions on that. Can you get someone else to deliver all the boring stuff? So that you're like completely engaged, like what that, you know, like the last thing I want to hear is the admin and where the toilets are. Like, I don't know, for me personally, if I wanted to engage with you, I'd be like, whoever's giving my intro, can you cover off all the, yeah. I agree. Yeah. But sometimes, you're it. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to be asked to say. Get your attention, rather than along, do some introduction. If there's any housekeeping, I mean, I, in business presentations that I run, there's kind of that expectation now, like when you jump on an aircraft and fly somewhere, the you know, health and safety video comes out and things, and you think, oh, I've seen that a million times, but you know that people get to do it. Go to Christchurch, I promise you, and do business presentations, they always t tell you what happens. If there's an earthquake, you're right, just that's our safety zone out there, please. You know, and you kind of would have laughed at that three years ago. Like, Anyone who has got friends and family that live down that way, and it should be the last week as well. Some of the cliffs collapsed today. Thousands and thousands of metres of soil fell down that cliff. And people didn't know that. So, not very nice thing to do. So, there's kind of that expectation that we talk about health and safety. Um, don't let it ruin the coolness of your presentation, is what we're saying, I agree. Uh, and the other thing is about the follow up and handouts. Should you be taking notes? Are you going to give them anything? Have you got an intranet site that people can go to to have a look at stuff? Should they be writing their own notes? Is there, you know, when are they going to get something as a follow up? So, those three things time, interaction, and handouts are things that I would strongly recommend that you have. So, there's actually quite a lot of things that you might do. I quite like this creative idea. It's setting the scene, isn't it? Yeah. And it's taking control right from the beginning. Um, so, you've talked, to, as you've talked a little bit about. Did you see or have you heard? What is a creative paper? Anyone have got any ideas? For one of my university uh, papers, which was on genres all that, yep. they started with a clip from a married uh, ex murderer. Good. And <laughs> basically, where that was mixing up with the genres, and that was just a way, okay, the topic, the entire course was about genres, and they got this thing that completely subverted the, <laughs> the genre to start to get us into it, which got everyone thinking. Yeah. And that they actually did that before they did the welcome and the intro. They just did that to draw the order. That was that game attention thing. Good. But the key with these things, it could just be something simple like getting people to put their hands up. It doesn't have to be any more sophisticated than that. But I have a show of hands here. Anybody who's ever played on like at a stadium before? Show of hands, anybody here who's ever done a presentation like this before? Anybody here go to Graham session in the morning? And you can actually get people quite to participate. Visual aid, movie club. I did, I, when I used to do presentations at the uni for getting people to engage in club sport, um, I used to go into lectures and I'd be filled with like 400 people and I'd say, stand up everyone who played sport at high school, and then like the whole room would stand up and then I'd say, okay, everyone in that end row, you stand up, so I'd leave 10% of the room standing. Everyone else sit down, I said, this will be a statistic of people playing sport at this university. Um, this is your chance to engage in all these statistics. Yeah. But the visual aid of them seeing that they all yeah. played sport to only those people are going to be left standing in the room. Massive buy into the conversation I had. And you know what? What made it so successful was that it was absolutely relevant to what we were talking about. And that's the key. That if, you, if you use these things, they're not compulsory. They have to be absolutely relevant. Because if you, you shock someone, or you tell a joke, or you do something that doesn't kind of work, that's not relevant to what's coming up. In your case, the genres. In your case, the participation. Um, you lose some from the beginning. 
Uh, I don't see an alphabet actually in talks. Uh, stories, you know, things that you've learned, someone you talk to, an athlete story that you could share, all of those things would fit perfectly in there. You do not have to have all of those things in every talk you ever give. This is only five minutes long, you can spend two or three minutes doing that stuff and then you get into the talk. So everyone race down to the bottom of the page and a couple of minutes before the end of your talk, what are some things that good presenters do at or near the end of their presentation to check that the key messages have been received and understood? Sum up. Sum up. Some sort of summary or wrap up. Some form of questioning to the crowd. Right. Might like do like a hand up poll. Yeah, right. So questions is really good. And you've got two sorts really. Yeah, you've got yours. You might have some questions that you want to ask for them. And then of course. If you haven't done so in your housekeeping or administration at the beginning, they might have some questions they'd like to ask you too. I think that's great. Or you can have one of your mates sit in the crowd and ask a couple of questions because once you get people talking, they usually the, the questions start rolling as well. That's great. One other thing that might you do, do you think? Bullet point, what do you through? Great. So that possibly falls through there, but key messages. Um, any other thoughts? Thank you. Yep. Thank you if you're any good too. So that would be, would be a good thing to do. You never have too many thank yous in a presentation. Kind of like a next step. Ah, good. So what happens next? And even in a coaching thing, it can be. So now we're all going out there and we're going to put it into practice. But in fact, in the presentations, it's like, now that I've said this, I will do this, and if you guys can do this, then I'm sure that will achieve the results that we And depending on the sort of presentation you're doing, some sort of a conclusion. And Lars, if you are one of those people that use creative openings at the beginning of your presentation, good for you. It's probably a good idea, just before the end of your presentation, that you return, I'll put the CEO there, but you return to that. So everyone, now that I've finished today, do you remember when I got you all to stand up this morning? And then only 10% of you were left standing after I did that exercise. If you can think about the things I've talked about today and we can put these systems in place at our university, you know what? How cool would it be in five years' time if half of you were still standing at the end of it? And that's really what this presentation is all about. How do we get that 10% to much, much more? So it gives it a relevance for fencing, no Jason, whether they came back and went back to the genre thing and then said, where does that fit? Um, that one there, it's kind of, <laughs> after they showed that video, they actually referred to it while they were doing it, like consistently yeah. through the rest of that introduction, was this an introduction yeah. uh, lecture? And they just kept on referring back to it. Um, and they would talk about one thing and then they'd say, oh, you may remember seeing this. Um, but it wasn't so much at the end, it was... Oh, as a, as a progress, yeah, progress. Like, like a theme, that's what makes it. Yeah. We just say at the end, okay, stand up, you're going to play club sport at university, and you have like 50% stand up. Oh, that's just... See if you can get it. Yeah. But then, you know, they're actually making sort of the measures. choice. They're making the choice to stand up yeah. and say, well, actually, I am, and it, all it's doing yeah. is ingraining. Yeah, that's you know, they're making a commitment by standing up. Um, Evangelical approach, I call it. Brainwashing. Hmm? Brainwashing. No, but I, I hope it's not. But anyway, you've, got to, you've got to, there's this thing in psychology called the Hawthorne effect, which is like people will do it and then they go home and then they'll think of why they shouldn't do it. So the, the, the real measure is what happens a month later when the club registrations go out and they don't actually sign up and that's the real commitment. So well done everyone, you do not have to have all of these things in every presentation do. If you don't, endings are really important things. The reason is because if it's been a long presentation, people are going to forget most of it. So that bullet point thing or the little summary you give at the end can help draw it all together. Endings are very important. So,
putting that into some sort of a structure. If you turn the page, please. I want to introduce you to this thing called the typical presentation sequence. There's a little bit more to go with it. The typical presentation sequence, everyone, is if you haven't got much time to prepare, somebody says, make sure I just wonder if I can get you to stand up and talk at the end of the speakers today. Or do you ever get asked on behalf of your sport to thank the speaker? You know, someone's got to get up and, you know, Kevin's talking to us today. Someone get up and say thank you to him at the end. And you've got to think, oh, you did quite a good job, actually. You've got to think, what the hell did he say? I've got to think of something. I've got to reflect back to the group something I took out of his presentation when I was asleep. I was texting at the same time. <coughs> that was a really interesting talk. Yeah, sometimes you have that sort of opportunity too. Or you have to do a report on some tournament that you took your team away to, or how the year went, or you know, KPIs, if you have those sort of things. And they, but you have to feed back to people, how did I go? There's this, uh, what I wanted to do. So, the typical sequence, this will get you through most talks and presentations you do. This will get you through anything you do in real life as well, like weddings and anniversaries, and 21st birthdays, things you have to talk about any short preparation time presentation. So there's five elements to it. We'll talk about them. Then we'll write a presentation about Graham's presentation this morning. I'll show you how quickly we can put presentations together using this sequence. So the first stage everyone is the subject and if you're writing some extra notes I'd encourage you to write underneath that statement subject. So today everyone we're going to talk about the coached advanced program here at Sport Waikato. So you actually, rather than just stick it up on a PowerPoint slide, or if you have no visual aids, you actually have to tell people about it there. Two, everybody is the agenda. So we talked about overviews before. What I mean by that is, if you take an extra notes, tell the audience the areas you're going to cover. Tell the audience the areas you're going to cover in your presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the Coach Advance Program is, how one gets selected to be on it, and then finally, what are the expectations of you for successful <coughs> applicants, the ones who actually make it on the program? What will our expectations of you be? Is it a two-year program? Very good, actually. Yeah. Well, it's, in principle, it's really a one-year program. Okay. What, what will the expectations of you be in the next 12 months? Please? Three, everybody is the body of the presentation, and that's going to be where you're spending the most of your time. And if you're taking some notes, I'd write down, cover each agenda area in order and detail. So, so you cover each agenda area in order and detail. So, performance advanced program. What is it? Cameron, give me a sentence. What does it do? Coach development. Can we see? Um, You're right. Just keep what, give me something else. Sharing of knowledge. Right, so it's a, it's a program essentially to develop coaches. One of the key ways we do it is to share knowledge. Best practice from the sport and best practice from guessing within the sports. Keep going. Ooh. Anything great. Right. Um, well, yeah, developing as a coach, different ideas. Yeah, uh, no one knows everything. So one of the outcomes of the year together is we take a whole bunch of different ideas and like the low hanging fruit, you grab onto good ones and you will develop as a coach too. Jason? Um, moving people out of their own sports bubbles and looking at shared experiences and all that to try to become better coaches. Right, I think it, to me, if you want to become really good at anything, best practice doesn't have to be in your own sport can be from other sports or other disciplines. So getting out of your bubble and hearing what other sports are doing well. I still don't know why. Anyone here from hockey? Mm -hmm. He was, he was. He was. <laughs> Shipped him up more. <laughs> <laughs> I was involved with football for years and hockey had this thing called the green card. They had a yellow card, a green card and a red card. And the smartest thing I would say, why can't football be like hockey? You get some hockey to play it screaming and shouting and you don't really want to send them off. So you should say, go and have your five minutes on the cinema and come back again later on. Cool down, mate. 
you know what, that would be a great thing that football would have been. Hockey. Right, what else does this program do? Um, John, I'm going to go to you next. Comparing and contrasting best practice. Great. And that is a hugely important thing if you're going to advance as a coach. Giving you a better framework to help you coach. Great. And all good coaching needs to have some sort of framework. Right? Is that what we talked about this morning? Is that planning, I suppose, was what mm. How to put a big plan together, how to do it for a year, a week, a season, individual players, how it all comes together as a big matrix. Challenging our thinking. Brilliant. If you think you know it already, you're probably in the wrong program. Yeah, absolutely. Have you all been challenged? How long has this been going for this program? Yeah, Nearly a year, so I'm one of the last people. Have you been challenged, Rach? Yeah, definitely. You feel like a better person having come on this? I feel that I learn lots of things every every time I come here and I try to implement some of them. <laughs> good, no, good on you. You can't do the whole lot. You can't do the whole and sometimes the bubbles, other sports don't do it as well as you do. Mm. So just but learning that you're doing it well can also be quite a good thing. Um, challenging assumptions and adding to the toolbox. There you go, gentlemen. That's, you know, that's, so that's a little bit about what this performance of Barge program is all about. All that stuff. And what does it mean for you? And what are you going to do differently in the next 12 months? Now, I won't ask you to present that to me today, but that's your data, that's your body. And then, picking up on a couple of the people's points, John was rather, you get to the end of the presentation. So just before you finish, you need to say, so you know, just before I finish today, here's a couple of things I'd like you to remember this, because you know, they're going to forget most of it. You've got to help me out here. So number one, the Advanced Performance Coach Program really is about sharing best practice from different sports and giving the coaches an individual toolbox that they can use to do their well better in the years to come. The key thing that your sport will get out of it, John, is your rugby, you touch, yeah, um, how will touch benefit from you coming on this course? On this course? Yeah. Uh, stronger. Yeah. Stronger. Yeah. You will help other coaches too, I hope. So it'll strengthen the whole of the coaching ability in touch rugby. And one thing, Ray, you're going to do in the next 12 months, having come on this course, would be? Uh, continually reflect on my coaching practice. Fantastic. So, you don't know it all. You keep looking to do it better, and can I do things better? So, conclusion. Now, everyone, most people forget conclusions in their presentations. It's rather interesting. They stop at the summary. Now, let me tell you what a conclusion is. You better write this down. Conclusion, everybody, is where you state or restate. State or restate. Conclusion, everyone, is where you state or restate the key objective or purpose of your talk. State or restate the key objective or purpose of your talk. And what you would like the audience to think or do differently. So state or restate, everybody, the key objective or purpose of the talk and what you would like your audience to think or do differently. So that little talk that we just wrote together on the performance of the Catch and Dance program is for, I guess, for new people coming on board. So by now you've seen what the program is all about and what some of our successful coaches are doing differently, I would like you to give some serious thought to applying on behalf of your sport in the next 12 months and continue.
continue, I guess, the groundswell upwards of quality culture. <laughs> well, and it will all be on the basis that you guys have done the good stuff. Okay, Separate things about. So, everyone, they're kind of like little milestones in some ways. And if you have those bits in them, thinking about the stuff that we've already talked about today, it can make a huge difference in terms of how you get your material across. So, Graham's presentation this morning was about planning. Planning. Any more specific? Sorry? Performance planning. Performance planning. Right. You know what that means. I suppose I'll find out in a minute. And what was the purpose of having giving that talk to you all? Having some. Uh purpose to what we do um, with our players and across the season. Right. That's sure that goes about your individual philosophy thing, is that sort of is that what's all about? So as coaches we should have a real purpose, was it? Mm -hmm. For our players. Excuse my scribble. Teams and what they do each season. And if you do that, what does that mean? So if you do have a purpose, you know that stuff, what's the benefit of that? They get better. Sorry? They get better. They improve. Is that sort of thing? So, well, create champions. Is that right? Both. Great. Well done. So, everyone, that's the subject. That's the conclusion. So, the agenda. What is performance planning? How you implement it. I'm making this up. What you will do differently. If anything. That's our agenda. So everyone help me out here. What is performance planning? Give me some nutshells. Identify current reality. Ooh. How do you do that? By um, analysing what the player thinks they where the player thinks they are what and the players. Benchmarks. Sorry? Benchmarks. Benchmarks. Ooh, yeah. Opposition analysis. Oh, really? That's fun. <laughs> yeah. Is there any coaching in here? I've got to tell you what I'm doing today. Good. Yeah, well, okay. So it's all good. So what else is performance planning? To the point where you need to be. Right. Okay. Gap analysis. So what analysis? Gap analysis. Ooh, okay. Sounds a bit scientific to me. Not bloody Sport New Zealand, is it? Doing all these horrible things. <laughs> Trying to turn a science, turn everything into a science when it doesn't need to be. <coughs> planning for, is it planning for performance? Or is it planning per performance? For performance. Okay. And what happens when you've done all this stuff? You run programs, that's what it does. No, you identify which are the key areas to work on and move forward with those instead of worrying about the stuff that doesn't matter. Okay, so identify the hanging fruit, is that right? Yeah. Go forwards. Okay, you're good. So, how do you implement it then? Once you've done all the stuff, how do you implement your plan? Goal setting. Strategies. Ooh. Running up the hill would have been better. More press ups. <laughs> Did anyone get to pass the ball around on these things? Change the training setting. environment to reflect in a wet and Great. That's a good one. Identify what's important. Work on that. Uh, is that part of goal setting? 
Oh, no, just without the outhead. No, because you could, you could, oh, yeah, I suppose. So how's your, do you, um, do you have to check up on it regularly? Do you have to review it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Live it. Sorry? Live it. Live it. Yourself. Live it. There you go. And what are you going to do differently? Keep it alive, is that the thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Revisit it. Revisit, keep going. Are you doing it now? Do you just, I mean, is this the first thing you've heard about someone? Reflex. Reflex. Hmm? Yep. Yeah. No, most of us are probably going to formalise it as a result of what we've heard. Thank you. Because we're all doing it in different ways. Mm -hmm. So it's given you our structure to mm -hmm. do things with. Start structure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like it. Adapt to our own um, needs. Own okay. needs means the sport that you're representing. Cool. Pretty happy with that. For a group that have forgotten most of what was said, it's not bad. <laughs> See, we've all remembered one thing. Hey? <laughs> I think they call it. I think they call it the wisdom of crowds. <laughs> Yeah, there's a... 20 percent something percent. So we went lastly, but by no means leastly, um, we have to do a summary. So we've got all these points up here for what performance planning is. So current reality, talk to players, benchmarks, opposition analysis, we need to be gap analysis, identifying key areas and going forwards. Which of those is the most important one? You can make it up. Probably identifying the areas and move forward. Thank you. Hope How do you implement it? Goal setting strategies, set training environments to be relevant. Review, live it. Which of those is the most important? Live it. Live it. Well, no, it doesn't matter, it's great. And finally, what will you be doing differently? Keep it alive, revisit, reflect, formalise, adapt to your own needs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that took us. Four minutes and about 16 seconds to write. So there's your presentation. <laughs> Simple, eh? So like seven minutes on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to type this up? Are you going to type this up so we can do it now? Or um, you can type it up for us. Think about what we talked about. I shall go down over here and present it to you. Anyone else want to present it? I think it's the first time we've ever heard about performance plan from anyone. Could be entertaining, how do you do it? Um, let's say I was Graham. Is he, did you give me handouts, Cameron? Did he give you a PowerPoint slide? Yeah. yeah. Is it, are these them? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so everyone, Mark and John have asked me to come along today and talk about performance planning. It's Craig. Craig. <laughs> 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 I don't like it. We had, we had a coffee about three months ago. Um, and I know that for most of you as coaches, you're doers, not thinkers and planners. And I know that when you get luck coming down with a silver fan on us, top from Sport New Zealand, you think, oh, here we go again, all bloody shit we have to do. We just want to get on to our own stuff. But you know, we're getting some remarkably good results this new module that we're giving to all our advanced performance coaches at the moment around the importance, everyone, of performance planning. We've all heard at some stage, nothing to do with coaching, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance and performance planning will improve your performances, I promise you. Now today is all about a quick overview of what it's all about. At the end of it, we have some handouts, a little slides, you can take them away. And I'm giving you a very general overview in the next five minutes or so. Because really, the outcome for all of you is to take the low hanging fruit out of here and apply it to your athletes, in your sport, in a way that's happening for you. So, by way of an overview, let me talk very briefly about what, in fact, performance planning is. And then, most importantly for you, how are you going to implement it in your sport? And if it's
it's going to be effective, it has to have an effect. Something has to change. If it ends up in the drawer of the rubbish bin, then I've wasted your time. And I've wasted my time getting into that as well. So something needs to change. That's what this whole course is about. So you run performance planning, really, by definition, is performing and planning for performing. <laughs> Who does the performing? Well, it's coaches you perform, before, but it's actually your athletes and your teams and your players that this program is really aimed at. It's about helping them perform as well as they possibly can do and certainly better than they're doing now. And in order to know how they're going to perform, the most important thing is to know how they're going now. There would be very few shot putters in the world that could teach Valerie Adams how to throw a shot put. There very few kayakers could teach Lisa Carrington how to paddle faster. But we don't have a country full of Lisa Carringtons and Valerie Adams as we have a country of aspiring athletes, young men and women, who are performing at different levels. So we need to get in touch with those people and say, well, where are they really at? What is their future? Do they really think that they're going to make it to the next grade or a representative level? Or is that just their mum and dad talking? We need to have a reality check. We need to talk to them to see where they're at. The one problem that New Zealanders have on an international stage is we all think we're better than we are. Unless you happen to be a netballer, or a rugby player, or a rugby league player sometimes. Most of us think we're pretty good until they step out on the international stage and they realise that the kind of college level versus most countries are looking. And what we really need to be doing for young athletes is not giving them benchmarks for the local community here in the Waikato or the New Zealand, but saying, hey, if you're going to get to this level, this is where you've got to be. And those benchmarks are global now for performance planning, not just in the local community. Again, same thing, we're going to look at their opposition, who they're playing against. Now, if you're a coach, different athletes and different teams play different styles, so that's one way we can face. Not everyone plays the same team play. But how do they train? How do they rest? How do they play as a team? What are they doing better than us? And we, if we get those things right, then you've got to say, well, where, where do I need to be doing differently to get where I am today? And what you find is where you are today, where you want to be. But in the middle, and surprise, surprise, there's no answer there. Performance planning helps you fill the gap. So, ultimately, what do you want to identify those key areas? Ultimately, you've got to figure out what are the key areas you need to fill in order for your sports team or athletes to go. So, how does one implement one of these things? It's all about doing. You can set all the goals you like for your athletes, but if they don't set them themselves, they're never going to achieve it. Nobody ever does anything somebody else wants them to do. So, you can figure out from them what they want to achieve and are they really committed to it, and then work with them <coughs> and their support team and their other families to create some strategies to help. One of the biggest clues I'll give you is that you need to make sure that whatever they want to improve on, you set the training environment to be like that. If they want to improve on passing a football, put them on a football field and get them to be able to pass it. If they want to practice swimming in a certain type of swimming pool, put them in that type of swimming pool. Set the training environment to make that happen. Because they don't do it on a stationary bike if you're a race scientist. At regular times, you sit down with them and the support team, you say, how are we going? Are we ahead of stuff? Where we want to be, where we're behind, where we want to be. Is it working? But you know, none of this stuff here means an obligation, to be honest, unless you actually live it. Performance coaching comes from the inside and the outside. You have to pre preach it, they have to believe it, and it has to be something that you talk about every time that you meet and discuss with your people. It has to be the living, breathing, real thing, not just a big piece of paper. Finally, as coaches, <coughs> what you do after this talk is more important than what you're doing now. Living thing, living.
doesn't you want to keep this thing alive. As long as the person is participating in school or your team is participating, it has to be done. Reflect and revisit. If you can get your athletes or your teams to self-reflect and self-revisit, you get extra points for that too. But as a coach, you do need to spend some of your time with them, thinking about what they're doing well, what's ready for them, and do we need to fine-tune stuff the wrong way? Because it has to be tailored for this board. Because it's a plan, it needs to be written down somewhere. JP Morgan, anyone know who he was? Jason, famous American industrialist. Said what gets measured gets done. What gets measured gets done. So you need to formalise it, it needs to be written down, it needs to be revisited. And if they don't know, because they haven't seen it written down, it's not on their mobile phone app. Key for all of you coaches is that this is a template. This actually works for no sport at all. The irony of this is this here works for no sport at all. It's a generic thing. What will bring it alive is your ability to take it and adapt it for your athletes and your sport. And once you formalise it, so, what are we talking about today? Identifying key areas for your teams and your athletes to go forward and be successful. It ain't worth nothing if it's just a piece of paper. You have to live it and revisit it all the time. And my strong advice as coaches is this is worth nothing to your support. It's a very generic presentation I do to every sport I think. What will make it come alive is your ability to adapt it your own needs and your athletes' needs. As coaches, having now been a year on my advanced performance coach course, you should know that if you want to make a real difference in your players and teams, you actually have a real purpose for them. And performance planning will allow each time, each session, and each engagement you have with those players and coaches to mean something and make a real difference. That's what coaching is all about, is helping people make a real difference. And if we can do that, we'll create our own champions and our own sports. And that is how performance planning will help you get there. Probably nothing like the brand new, but you can see where we're going. Now, so everyone, if you can actually. Make it till you make it. Well, you've got to have, you've got to have the content, right? That's the have the content to be successful. So in four and a half minutes, you can write a 10 minute presentation if you need to. But the purpose of that exercise was twofold. One is to show you how to go about doing it on a piece of paper. And then remember the subject, agenda, body, summary, and conclusion. And words for wedding speeches, funerals, 21st birthdays, and other things as well. Farewell speeches. And Prize giving, there's all those things you might have to do over and above. And it's as simple as that, really. Although, how to present it, of course, is what we need to talk about. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Because we've all been pretty quiet. We're all stunned. Alright. Why don't you do it yourself, then? <laughs> There you go, there's, there's a notes page at the back of the book. And you're going to write the 10-minute presentation. There probably won't be time to do them all today, but I will check out. The subject is an advanced perspective on my sport. It's because you're advanced coaches. And the agenda, because you didn't introduce yourselves, is what is my sport? Second thing is if I was king or queen for a day, what is one thing I would change in my sport? Does that make sense? So I am a triathlete, or my sport is triathlon. If I was king or queen for a day, I would set up a base in Africa to play up the juice with lots of drugs and that. <laughs> <laughs> and from my perspective, if you're Peter Jenner item, this would help by giving people a training environment in high altitude with the best athletes in the world. 
Vice Wind and the keys would be Tycrex. You can't possibly go wrong with Chrome if we do that. So, here's your challenge, everyone. I might get some of you to do this over the course of the day. So, an advanced perspective on my sport is your subject. Agenda, what is my sport? What is the thing of queen for a day? What is one thing you change in your sport? Finally, from your perspective, how would that help if you make that change? That's what you can do in 10 minutes. So you can have a conclusion. There's a note space. Am I seeing you next week, Craig? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, seriously.